Amen. Go ahead and have a seat, guys. Uh, my name is Matt Tebow. I serve here as the lead pastor, and it is a joy to be able to uh, serve in this church that is 17 weeks old. 17 weeks old is all, and God is doing amazing things in many, many lives. Today is a special Sunday. We have baptisms a little later on. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, which is communion. But before we do that, we're going to jump into his word. So if you have a, gra- a Bible, go ahead and take it and turn over to Colossians chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one under a seat nearby you. You can grab that and turn over to page 924. Colossians is in the New Testament, which is the right half of your Bible. So if you get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just keep going to the right. Acts, Romans, a couple of Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, then Colossians. Again, if you don't have a Bible, page 924 on the one that we're going to give to you as a gift. We want you to have a copy of God's Word, though. And as you turn over there, I want you to think with me about just how fascinating the human brain is. Fascinating. And one occasion where it's really highlighted is when a puzzle is brought out on the holidays. You tracking with me here? Everyone's got that family member who likes to say, let's do a puzzle. Now, I don't know if some of you are born this way or if this particular condition develops over time, but what often happens is that when a puzzle comes out, there are certain personalities who just go bonkers, right? They, they just get obsessive, compulsive about this puzzle. Any, anyone willing to admit that? No, just kidding. You don't have to admit that, right? It doesn't matter if it's 50 pieces, 100 pieces, 500, 1,000 piece puzzle, but that person is going to commit, it, commit all the way until the end. Now, personally, I'm the guy that likes to go steal a couple pieces when they're not looking just to mess them up. And if you just had a visceral reaction to what I just said, then this illustration is for you. Now, some people, when this puzzle gets dumped out, there is this kind of hyper-focus, extra-compulsive energy that arises within them that nothing else really matters. It could be the holidays, there could be great food, your family has come into town from miles away, and you no longer care about any of it. You are going to get this puzzle done. Some of us observe this phenomenon, and often we will try to intervene, I being one of them. Hey man, you know that's like a thousand piece puzzle, and the response being, and your point? Hey man, you know that according to Google, a thousand piece puzzle is going to take you nine hours to complete... And yet, they are so committed to completing this puzzle that they don't care. I've watched people do it until the wee hours of the night. And guys, listen, you know this is true. Agree? You've seen this happen before? You're you're like, yeah, that's me, Matt. You're talking about me at the holidays. Well, I think that the puzzle phenomenon simply gives us a window into something that's true about the human heart. It gives us a window into something that we can all resonate with, which is this. We like completion. Amen? We like things to be together. We like them to be whole. That wasn't a very enthusiastic amen, by the way. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. When something is broken and imperfect, incomplete, we want to see it put together. And when we start something, we want to see it finished. Well, friends, this little phenomenon, we'll call it the puzzle frenzy, it gives us a window into the inner working of not only the brain and the emotions and the will, but really the heart. The heart this broken puzzle that is our soul. And I believe that each of us has this inner longing to see our own soul put back together, our soul to reach a state of completion. And this compulsion to complete the inner longings of the soul will manifest in all sorts of different pursuits. But as we study God's word together here in Colossians, what I want to share with you this morning is that what we do with that inner compulsion And how we strive to reach that state of completion in the inner man matters. It matters how we pursue being complete. So if you'll give your attention to Colossians chapter 2, I want to read for us God's word before working back through it line by line, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph. And the title for the message today is this. It's complete in Christ. Complete in Christ Please follow along now as I read Colossians 2, verses 8 through 15. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, 
according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. For in him the fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And these are God's words for us this morning. Our big idea this morning, the main idea of this passage that the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul intended for us is this. It's that I'm complete in Christ because of what he accomplished for me. And think about what we're saying here. I am completed in Christ, not by anything I do, not by any other pursuit that I can run after, but I'm actually completed, I'm fulfilled, I'm satisfied in Christ because of things that he did for me, not anything that I've done for myself. And so what I want to show you guys, and this, is, this has the potential legitimately to change your life. This passage is one of the supreme passages on the gospel and what Jesus has accomplished in all the Bible. And what I want to show you from this is an answer to the question, what he did to do that for me. What did Jesus accomplish in order to make me complete in him? And I want to show you five accomplishments from these verses, verses 8 through 15, that again, I think are life-changing. There's nothing we can do to satisfy that inner longing that comes out in puzzles, but really that is deeply seated in our soul, but it's all about what he has done. So let's look back at this line by line. Number one, then, I am complete in Christ because number one, he has grafted me into his power. He has grafted me or placed me into his power. Look back up at verse eight. We need to set a little bit of context, get a running start. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy. Now, what's going on here? If you were here last week, you remember we were talking about walking in Christ. Life is better when we walk with Jesus. Remember that? Life is better when we walk with Jesus. But the question is, is how do we walk with Jesus? And what is the threat to doing that? And if you look at verse 19, there's a phrase at the end of 19 that has caught my attention. And he speaks of growing with a growth that is from God. Now, where my mind goes is, how on earth do you grow with a growth that is not from God? Presumably, then, it is possible, loved ones, for you and I to grow even in the spiritual realm with a growth that is not from God. And the question is, how does that happen? I think it happens when we try to grow void of his power, void of the true power that Jesus provides. And so Paul warns in verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy. Philosophy. Now, philosophy is simply the combination of two words, phileo and sophia. Phileo is love. Sophia is wisdom. So philosophy is the love of wisdom. And whenever we pursue the love of wisdom as an end to itself, it is bad news. It's bad news. Philosophy from the ancient Greek Stoics all the way up until today is simply based on natural observations and man's reason. And I'll tell you, it's only led man further and further away from God. When we try to figure it out in our own ability to reason or just observe and find God out there somewhere, I'll tell you, we will never arrive there. And that's why Paul warns, the Spirit of God warns through Paul, don't get taken captive by philosophy. And then I think what follows in verse 8 is simply a description of that philosophy. So what is philosophy? Look at your Bibles. He says it's empty deceit. Philosophy, which is empty deceit. Where does it come from? It comes from human tradition that's passed on. It originated with man and it's passed on from generation to generation. 
And what's it all about? It's about the elementary spirits or elementary principles of the world. And so really at its base level, this is what Paul's saying, that all attempts to philosophize our way to meaning and purpose and even God, they're basic. They are the ABCs. It's looking for meaning in things like the stars or things like the rocks or things like creation or things like celebration, ceremonial cleansings with water or with food. In fact, if you look down, that's why Paul says, verse 20, if if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why as if you were still alive in the world do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And these are all things that perish, he says. Verse 23, they have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they're of no value. And so, in verse 8, the command is, guys, stay away from that. Stay away from it. Stay away from an idolatry of things that are related to substance and science and even the flesh. Don't get captured. Don't get taken captive. Why? Because if we get sucked in as a church family, if we get sucked in to the best that man can offer, we will actually risk our ability to walk with Jesus and experience life in its fullness and we will compromise our ability to stand firm in the faith. This is why he's warning us that this is a critical matter. Look at it. See to it, he says. See to it that no one takes you prisoner. No one takes you captive. And friends, he wouldn't be saying that if it wasn't a legitimate threat. So uh, I think that especially in a post-Christian, contemporary, academic context, we have got to be on guard for this, loved ones. We've got to watch out for people presenting human reason, human philosophy, even human science at times that's opposed to God in exchange for walking step by step with Jesus. When we do that, what we risk is actually subtraction. By our addition to Jesus being the thing that satisfies our soul, when we try to say Jesus plus philosophy, Jesus plus human tradition, Jesus plus ceremonialism, and even religion, when we add anything else to Jesus, it is actually subtraction by addition. Why? Because we are diminishing the preeminence of his ability to be our all in all. So here's the point for us. To be complete, to satisfy that inner longing of completion in the soul, we don't need the best that man has to offer. We simply need the best man. Tracking with me there? And that best man is who? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. This is why over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul, in an amazing manner, calls Jesus in verse 30. He says, because of him you're in Christ, who became to us the wisdom of God. Paul refers to Jesus in 1 Corinthians 1.30 as the wisdom from God. So what is our philosophy? Our philosophy about life and how it works and why we're here and the purpose of man, it is Christ and Christ alone. Returning to Colossians 2 then, he warns us, don't get taken captive by all this stuff that man is going to brew up, which is really just basics at the end of the day. It's the elemental principles of the world, not according to Christ. And then look what he says in verse 9. For in him, that is Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Now, the the particular heresy or threat that was facing the Colossian church is called Gnosticism. G-N-O-S-T-I-C. Gnostic. And the Gnostic heresy said that everything physical is bad and only the spiritual is good. And that would include the person of Jesus. So the Gnostics uh, attested to some form of Jesus that he was the son of God, but they would not admit that he had a human nature. And it took the church several hundred years to get this straightened out. But friends, when you begin to deny a portion of who Jesus is, like his full humanity, for example, all kinds of implications follow. And so what Paul says here is that in him, the whole fullness of deity, so he's 100% God, dwells bodily. At the same time, he's 100% man. And the reason that's important is what comes in the next verse. And you have been filled in him. You have been filled in him. You have been made complete, 
some translations say. You are completed in him. So this 100% God, 100% man also now is our 100% completion. Guys, here's the point. In our pursuit of finding satisfaction of the soul, in our pursuit of finding completion in this life, we need to remember that Christ has done it for us and that he has actually grafted us in to his power. He has grafted us in to his power. That's why right in between 8 and 10, there's that reminder that he is all the way God and he is in you. He's in you. And therefore now our identity, our uh, self-reflection of the soul is founded with a new identity in Christ. At the same time, that means that all these other pursuits, all these other threats, whether it's religion or whether it is some sort of tradition or attempts to be more holy and sinless apart from Christ are actually in opposition to him. So I think here's here's the lesson for us today. When we try to make changes in our lives on our own, they may be good, but they're not necessarily from God. There can be good changes that happen, right? You can pursue self-help programs, And we can look at our friends sometimes and say, hey, that was a good change. But that doesn't mean it's from God. We can uh, seek to do some sort of modification of behavior or even cognitive behavioral therapy at times. And there may be good things that come from that. But that doesn't mean that it comes from God. Again, the end of verse 19, if we want to pursue a growth that is a growth from God, we need to remember that it is His power, it is Christ's presence in us that is actually producing the change. The word for us today is that we're complete in Christ because we've been grafted into Christ. And loved ones, listen. Listen to what I'm saying here. That means when you get stuck in your sin, what you need is more of Christ. That means when you experience anxiety, which is the plague of the 21st century, especially post-COVID, when you feel anxiety, what you need is more of Christ. It means that when you are depressed or you're double-minded or you're struggling deep in the soul, what you need is more of Christ. Complete means complete. And don't forget that you are grafted into his power, loved ones. That's a life-changing reality. Okay, so to be complete, we need to remember that I am complete because of what he has done for me and his power is in me. But second... From this passage, another thing that Jesus has done for us is that I'm complete in Christ, look back at your text, because he gave me a new heart. And Paul is going to launch into something that's a little bit foreign to us as 21st century Gentiles, but would not have been foreign to a Jewish audience, which is the idea of circumcision. Look at verse 11. It says, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now in the Old Testament, back in Leviticus chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, all Jewish boys were circumcised on the eighth day. Why was this a even command from God? Because according to Genesis 17, this was the sign of the covenant. It was the sign of the promise from God to his people. And it was really meant to be an outward demonstration of the need for cleansing for God's people. They were so sinful that he was setting them apart even from their very beginning that the basic, even most central components of who you are as a human needed to be cleansed. But all along, even in Deuteronomy chapter 30, which is very early in our Bibles, the fifth book, listen to what God said in Deuteronomy 30 verse 6. It says, The Lord will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul that you may live. So what's going on here? Well, let me me depict it in another way. When you run barefoot outside, you develop calluses. Anyone got any crazy little kids that run around outside? Yes, I do. And, uh, And Trina was that kid as a child as well. So when you run around outside without shoes on, you develop calluses, right? And what a callus is, is it allows you to basically be invincible, So when you hit a home run over the dirt road, I was kind of the wimpy kid who couldn't actually walk across the gravel without, ow, ooh, ooh. But there were some of my friends who just went running across the gravel road. Calluses make it so that your foot is no longer sensitive. You don't have any pain receptors. So these little tykes, like my kids right now, can run on rocks. They can run on glass. They could probably run on nails. 
I mean, there are people in this world today who can walk across hot coals. And maybe it's just a mental thing, but it's probably because they have massive calluses built up. But if you've ever had a callus, you know, when that thing gets ripped off, ooh, man, that is a whole new level of sensitivity, right? The layer underneath where that callus was now is sensitive, and it's painful, and it responds to any sort of little bump in the road, certainly to a rock or a piece of glass. And loved ones, here's the point. You are born with a sinful, hardened, calloused heart toward God. You are born with a heart toward God that all it wants to do is rebel. All it wants to do is speak lies and to disobey. You love yourself and you're insensitive to the things of God and to your sin against a holy and righteous God. What's needed then to be right with him is not just to give more effort. It's not just to think harder or be more religious or to reach a state of meta. But what's needed is that you need a new heart. You need a new heart. That's what each one of us is born into this world needing, a heart that is now sensitive to God and to sin. And so this Old Testament idea from our passage here in verse 11, it's really symbolic of the entire human flesh. Look at verse 11. That's why he says, you need a circumcision without hands by putting off the body of the flesh, putting off the sinful nature, so to speak, that is within you. You need it gone. And this theme gets developed in Ezekiel 36 as needing a new heart with the heart of stone being replaced with a heart of flesh. It's developed in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You become a new creation in Christ. It's developed by Jesus in John 3, 3, where you must be born again, born from above with a brand new life given to your spirit. And it's developed in Romans 6, 6, when he says you must crucify the old self, crucify the old flesh and be renewed in the newness of life. That's the idea of Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. And so I want to ask, friends, has this happened to you? Do you have this new nature? There are three people that are going to be baptized later today who are going to testify of the new life, the new heart that's been given to them in Christ. Out with the old, in with the new. Are you here today, though, and this is not yet a reality for you? If you are, I want to encourage you that it's a simple step of obedience and faith in Christ, trusting in his accomplished work for you, that the Spirit then regenerates and removes the old, cleanses the old, and brings forth that which is new. Isn't that a life-giving message this morning? Come on. That's the life-giving hope of the gospel, that we can be made new in him. So this is the thing that, listen, the thing that we need, that compulsive desire to be complete, it's not actually something we do, but something that's been done. And namely, that we've been grafted into his power. And second, that we have been given a new heart. But if you look back at your Bible, it leads right into then a third thing, which is that this new heart produces now a new life. That number three, I'm complete in Christ. I've got all I need in Christ because number three, he has gifted me new life. Look at verse 12. He says then, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And so in the mind of Paul, which is given to us through the Spirit of God, he switches analogies from circumcision now to baptism. And I think that what he's doing here is that while circumcision was the removal of that which is old, symbolically, of our spiritual life. Baptism is the immersing into that which is new and the raising up to walk out now a new life. That's why I say, yes, he's given us a new heart, but that new heart is producing for us a new life. In fact, just one little field trip. If you turn to your left to the book of Romans, a few little letters past the books of Corinthians, but before Acts, Romans chapter 6 same author of Colossians, the Apostle Paul, a man who was more sinful than even many, at least outwardly, and yet redeemed by God's grace. He writes these words in Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then, he says, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, since I'm forgiven by grace, can I just keep on sinning? And he says, by no means, exclamation point. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been 
baptized or placed into Christ Jesus were baptized or placed into his death. We were buried, therefore, with baptism into his death. And here's the point. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, that we too might what? Walk in newness of life. So friends, this is the idea in Colossians 2. It's what he's saying here in Romans 6, that our spiritual baptism is that process where we were uh, crucified in the flesh with Christ in order to be raised up to walk in newness of life. Tracking? Give me a quick thumbs up. Tracking? All right, great. Go back to Colossians 2. Colossians 2. And I want to comment just briefly because of the confusion that I think the church, and maybe some who are not part of the true church at times, have had with regard to circumcision and baptism. So circumcision was the sign of the covenant, which is to say it was the symbol of the promise. God made a promise to the nation of Israel, you will be my people, and he promised them all kinds of blessings, seed, a generational seed, a land, their blessing, and that he would fight their their battles. He would win their wars. And the sign then of that covenant was circumcision. Now question, when did they receive the sign of the covenant? answer on the eighth day. So essentially when they were born. The requirement then in the Old Testament to be part of the people of God, the family of God, was simply to be born a Jew. And so when you were born a Jew, or later on proselytized to bring into the Jewish people, you received the sign of the covenant. Well now as we get to the New Testament, there's a new family of God. There's a new covenant or promised people of God, and it's called the church. It's all those who have placed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now the requirement to be part of the people of God is no longer to be born. No, no, no. The requirement now is to be born again. It's the requirement to have faith, to actually personally respond to, repent of your sin and place faith in the Lord Jesus. But in the same way, the sign of the covenant, which now is baptism, not just the cleansing of that which is old, but the full immersion and walking forth in life, that sign of baptism is applied when you enter into the new covenant people of God. Translate, when you place faith in Jesus, that is the time to receive the sign of baptism. So again, we're going to do that later today. And let me tell you, these three members of our church are not looking to this baptism as their means of salvation. They are not looking to this baptism as a means of furthering their Christian walk. They are simply doing this as an act of obedience to depict or to give a little Polaroid picture of that which has already gone on inside of them. Tracking? This is, this is uh, <laughs> so commonly confused, and yet in reality, I think it's very, very simple. Circumcision was for the Old Testament nation of Israel. When you were born into that nation, baptism is the sign for the new covenant people when you are reborn and actually a true believer. So uh, if we step back and look at it, guys, there will be no works that we do that impress God. When we get to heaven and he says, why should I let you into heaven? I pray fervently for you and I hope that not one of us will say, Lord, I read my Bible. I pray and hope that not one of us will say, Lord, I showed up to church at least three out of four Sundays. Some of you are like, I got to get here a little bit more. Don't, that's not the point. I pray that none of us will say, Lord, I got dunked in a feed trough outside of Doxa Church. That is not going to be enough. Trust me. That's not going to impress a holy and almighty God who created this entire universe with one word. What is going to be enough is to say, Lord, I've trusted in the ever-precious blood of Jesus, which was provided for my sake, and I've trusted in that sacrifice as my righteousness now. Are you tracking with me, people? This is the gospel, okay? This is what it's all about. We've got to trust in his provided work for us, and that's what's going to make us complete in Christ. All right, let's look back at Colossians chapter 2 then. Being complete in Christ is all about what he's done for us, not what we do for ourselves. He's grafted us into his power. He's given us a new heart. He's given us new life. Number four, and this is important, because some of you, even with all this new, new heart, new life, we're looking forward, you struggle with what you've done. I've sat with some of you in my living room, and you've told me, I've done some horrible things, Matt. What does that mean for me? I've got skeletons in my closet. You don't even know what I've done. Well, here's the good news. 
Part of being complete in Christ is that he has granted me a pardon. And that's the fourth consideration from this passage. He has granted me a pardon. And before we read that, I just want to ask you, have you ever wondered how forgiveness works? Like, actually, how does forgiveness work? Let's say you bought a house in this market, and in two years from now, God forbid, the market crashes to the bottom. Not only is your down payment gone, but now you're upside down on your mortgage. And now you're getting laid off at your job, and you no longer have a stream of income, and you've got to file for a little thing called bankruptcy. Well, in that bankruptcy court, as the judge rules that your debt is going to be forgiven, and you walk away because you have no money to give, have you ever wondered, where does that money go? Like, who actually pays for, let's say you owe 200000 who actually pays that $200,000 that you were upside down in your mortgage for? Someone has to pay for it, right? It doesn't just go on into thin air. And typically, it's either the lender who covers that bill or Uncle Sam who steps in and covers your debt. Well, I don't know about you, but growing up, I was always told there's no such thing as a free lunch. Yes? What about spiritually, friends? If we truly owed a debt, which we do, who pays for the debt and how is it actually removed? Forgiveness is never free. Someone has to pay. And if you ever attended a single Sunday school, you know the answer is Jesus. But how does it actually work? Well, if you look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, this is where I think there's the power to change your life, even from these two verses. He says, you, verse 13, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. He made you alive together with Jesus. How? Having forgiven us all our trespasses. There's the forgiveness of debt. How? Verse 14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us. Stop right there. He's taken the sheet that listed your debt, the mortgage note or the invoice, and in the Old Testament, he took that piece of papyrus and he got some water and he erased it like a dry erase board. That's the idea of the text. He has, look at it, he has canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands in the courtroom. And I still want to ask one more time, how? Look what it says. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Doxa Church, I want you to sit in this for a moment with me. I want you to think about what was just said here. That in Christ, you have been granted a pardon of an immeasurable debt. Your debt has been erased. Your sentence has been undone. Your sin has been forgiven. Why? Not just because God chose to forget about your debt, Right? The $200,000 that you owed in court doesn't just go away, but someone stepped in and paid for it. Someone stepped in and actually appeased every dollar that was owed. And trust me when I say the debt that we owed was not just $200,000. It was our lives. It was our souls. It was our lives for an, e- an eternity to come because the debt was so great. And yet this is the gospel that Jesus has stepped in and paid the entirety of that debt for us. Amen? I mean, that's the good news, friends. He canceled it. And look what it says. He set it aside, not just forgetting it, but nailing it to the cross. I want you to think next time when you're reflecting on your previous sins, which all of us can do, or when you do sin, that your immorality was nailed to the cross. Your uh, ongoing lies that you've told was nailed to the cross. Your greed All of the forms of uh, sins of omission and sins of commission, everything you've ever done that's sinful, if you've trusted in Christ, was nailed to the cross. And now we no longer have that debilitating feeling that can rise up when you owe someone a debt. Owning a debt can be manipulating, it can be debilitating. Proverbs talks about the borrower being a slave to the lender, and yet Jesus is not holding that piece of paper and dangling it over us. He has ripped it up He's erased it and washed it clean so that we are forgiven. Friends, we're talking about deep stuff. This is soul work. This is down to the core of who you are. And yet, as we search to be complete, as we search for satisfaction, what Colossians is presenting to us through the Spirit is that we are complete in Christ. Nothing we've done, but everything that He has accomplished for us. And God, forgive us when we're fools and we try to earn it some other way. 
when we take a little bit of philosophy, a little splash of human tradition, a little bit of the, of the creation worship or whatever else it may be, Lord, forgive us. May our all in all be in Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen? Man, I want to show you a final thing here. Colossians chapter 2, not only has Christ accomplished all of these facets, but there's one more thing he's done. And number five, it's that he's guarded me from the enemy. Look at verse 15. He has disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Guys, I don't know if you know this, but right now, at this very second, there is a spiritual war that is happening. A couple books to the left in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul warns us in verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Friends, there's no other way to interpret that. There is a spiritual war happening now. Demons and angels duking it out over your souls. There is a war that's happening in the world around us through the circumstances in your life, through the media that's presented to you, through the people that are not following God that are in your sphere. But what you need to know from Colossians 2 verse 15 is that these demons, these spiritual forces are engaging in a final battle of a war that's already been won. They're engaging in a final battle to try to deviate and distract and pull some away, but it's in a war that has ultimately been won. How do we know? Look back at verse 15. God has disarmed all rulers and authorities. That's in the spiritual realm. And he's put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. The cross is the means of the victory. Jesus is the conquering king who, according to this verse, has rendered them useless. He's stripped them of their weapons. He's handcuffed them behind their backs, and he is parading them a final time before the home base. This is the picture here, that Jesus is the snake crusher. So in our home, every night we read, pray, sing with our little kids, with our family, and we circulate through different Bibles. And one of them, because of Genesis 3.15, the promise that Eve's great, 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 great grandson would crush the head of the serpent, one of these Bibles refers to Jesus the whole time as the snake crusher. I love that. He's the snake crusher. James will talk to me about the snake crusher sometimes. He crushes the head of the serpent. And where did he crush the head of the serpent? He crushed it at the cross. And because of that, we no longer have to fear that's the point, right? He's guarded us from the enemy and we no longer have to fear. Guys, you don't have to live with a debilitating fear of God. Yes, a reverent fear, but not a debilitating fear of God. But we get to be those who know Christ and live with nothing to fear because our enemy has been defeated and we are protected by the power of Christ. So I'm complete in Christ because he's guarded me from my enemies. Now listen, guys, just to wrap this up, here's the point that God would have for us this morning. We each, to different extents, have this inner drive. We want to see things wrapped up. We want to see them completed. Some of you that love puzzles, more power to you. I love you. Do the puzzle. But beware of that which has no chapter and verse in your Christian life. The world is out to get you. There are a thousand ways to deviate from the one true path of following Jesus. Friends, what I want, if you remember one thing, here it is. You're complete in Christ, so as a Christian, run to him. Run to Jesus and keep on running to him. It's possible to grow with a growth that doesn't come from God, but if we want to grow in a way that's honoring to God and centered on the person and work of Jesus, then run to him. Don't get caught up in the philosophies and the traditions and the religion and the ascetic forms of legalism, but run to Jesus and find your completion in him. Before we go, and we're going to transition to a time of communion and then baptisms, so I want to leave you with two questions, just two. We'll call them learning to live. We don't just learn to get smarter, but we learn so that we can actually obey and our lives would be different. The first question is this, have I received Christ's work for me? Friends, you might be visiting here for the first time. Maybe you've been coming for a while, but I want to tell you, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's a universal offer, and yet it's not universally applied. You must personally place faith in Jesus's finished work 
for you. That means embracing him as not only your savior, but also your Lord. That you're turning the ship of your life and turning from sin, running toward Christ. That's the first question. Second is this. Am I looking to Christ alone for my completeness? Is Jesus alone your source of completeness? Guys, this is so awesome. Because Jesus has completed the thing that we need most, which is the settlement, the satisfaction of the soul. The point, arguably, of Colossians as a whole is based out of chapter 2, verse 10. You are complete in him. Are you looking to him for your completion? If not, this is God's word for you this morning. Be complete in Christ. Be complete in him. I'm complete in Christ only by what Jesus has accomplished for me. May that be true of us as God's people. Would you join your hearts with me now as I close this in prayer?